Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Malka Simkovich. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, here in Chicago, it's a high of five degrees on a very, very snowy cold winter day. I hope that if it is likewise cold where you are, that you are safe and warm. Before I begin, I would like to thank today's sponsor, Pessy and Asher uh, Reimer, in memory of Pessy's father, Jack Singer, Avram Yaakov Ben Harav Eliyahu, and we are learning in his memory today. Uh, like I said, feel free to put questions or comments in the chat, but please note that I will not be reading the chat box as we go along. I do hope to end at around 10 Chicago time, 10.45 to 10.50, so that's 11.45 to 11.50 on the East Coast, uh, saving some time for conversation at the end of the class. Uh, and so now, without further ado, I will begin. Those of you who were able to attend last class might remember that we concentrated on a few big ideas, a few big ideas about the Second Temple period. And of course, we have to start with the history of this period before turning to the Apocrypha, because the Apocrypha is just a tiny representation of the literature that survived. So among these few big ideas is that Second Temple Judaism is not sectarian, by which I mean by the third century BC, by the middle of the Second Temple period, Jews are established all over the Hellenistic world. By the first century BCE, the Roman historian Strabo says, wherever you go in the Roman empire, you will find a synagogue. But even before that, there are Jews living throughout the known world. These Jews are not sectarian, but they're also not assimilated. And this is, I think, a big mistake that people make when they think about diaspora and Judaism of the Second Temple period. These are, for the most part, not assimilated Jews. Jews, wherever they live, are observing what we call common Judaism, identifying markers of Judaism at this time being the Sabbath, dietary laws, and circumcision, and coming together regularly to read the scriptures, to read the Torah, and to interpret them. Wherever you were in the ancient world, these are the things that you would do to identify yourself as a Jew. Even in the region of Judea, the vast majority of Jews are not sectarian. Josephus provides us with these numbers, 6,000 Pharisees in the first century, 4,000 Sadducees, 3,000 Essenes, Josephus is known to inflate his numbers, and so you're talking about a very, very tiny percentage of Judean life actively affiliating with a sect. That doesn't mean that they're not in the public eye. Josephus says that the masses follow the Pharisees. The Pharisees occupy positions of leadership. The Sadducees occupy positions of the priesthood, but it does mean that you could follow the teachings of a sect without actually being part of the sect. And so first of all, when we think about Second Temple Judaism, many of us think about this world of infighting and divisiveness and being fractured. This is not the case. The vast majority of Jews are practicing common Judaism, whether they're in Judea or in the diaspora, circumcision, Sabbath, dietary laws, the regular reading of the scriptures. And what does this mean? It means that we should not make a cultural binary between where you live in the ancient world and what kind of Judaism you practice, nor should you make a language binary between what language you speak, Greek in the West, Aramaic in the East, maybe Hebrew in the land of Israel, that's an open academic debate. Uh, so there is no relationship between what language you spoke and your level of piety, just like today, you might have Yiddish speaking Jews in upstate New York, and you might have Jews in Tel Aviv enjoying their Sherm cocktails. There is no determination of where you live and how you practice your Judaism in the Second Temple period. So one big idea that we discussed, Second Temple Judaism is not sectarian. Judaism is a global religion by the second century BCE. The second big idea that we discussed is that the Apocrypha represents a small slice of the second temple corpus of literature that survives. We talked about other categories of literature that were produced, especially in the late second temple period, the 
vast corpus of the writings of Josephus. Remember, he writes four big things, the autobiography known as Vita, which means life in Latin, the first systematic defense of the Jewish religion to have ever been produced, and we're going to look at that a lot today against Appian, a seven volume account of the Jewish rebellion against the Roman Empire known as aptly the Jewish war. And finally, his magnum opus, a 20 volume work of the history of the Jewish people going all the way back to the beginning of Genesis. And this is Antiquities of the Jews, which he wrote towards the end of his life in the late 90s CE from Rome. And so that's just Josephus, right? And then you have Philo of Alexandria, who likewise writes many, many, many treatises, philosophical treatises, uh, treatises that interpret the writings of the Bible, massive corpus of work from uh, Philo. We have the New Testament, which I believe is a collection of primarily Jewish texts written in the first century at the end of the first century CE. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls, which I said, I tried to say controversially was the very worst thing to have ever happened to the Second Temple period. And if you were not there last week and you're curious about why I think the Dead Sea Scrolls are the worst thing to have happened to the Second Temple period, I could repeat that at the end of the hour. And the Pseudepigrapha. The Pseudepigrapha, which is a massive collection of texts that were not canonized, that have no internal relationship with each other, that were written anywhere between the fourth century BC and the fourth century CE. And the Pseudepigrapha is essentially a modern collection uh, that began in the 18th century when Johann Fabricius, this Protestant scholar from Germany, goes around Europe collecting ancient texts from libraries and monasteries. And so we have an enormous amount of pietistic Jewish literature written in the late Second Temple period, some in Hebrew, but I would say most of what we have today was written in Greek or circulated in Greek, but maybe was originally written in Hebrew because we're dealing with a, 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 a majority of a global community that speaks Greek. And so if the Apocrypha represents a tiny, small splice of what we have, right? Philo, Josephus, Pseudepigrapha, New Testament, Dead Sea Scrolls, you have to imagine an a fortiori, a, a, a calvachomer here, Imagine how much was written that has not come down to us over the past 2000 years. I think that what we have today is a tiny, less than 1%, tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of what Jews were writing. And this is an incredibly prolific time. Jews are writing and writing and writing in the second century and first century BCE. Uh, and so, you know, I think that there is a tendency to look at the Apocrypha and look at the text of the Second Temple period and say, well, you know, the rabbis did not quote these texts. So they're liminal to my understanding of the development of authentic Judaism, right? I have the Tanakh and I have the Mishnah and the Midrash and rabbinic literature, right? I have the world of the rabbis and I have the world of the Tanakh, but everything in between is sort of liminal to the authentic development of Judaism. That's not, it doesn't pertain directly to me as a rabbinic Jew or someone who has inherited the rabbinic tradition. And this is really historically a falsity because most of the texts that we have, and probably many of the texts that we don't have, are pietistic texts written by Jews who revere the scriptures as authoritative and who in many ways are proto-rabbinic. Okay, so these are just a few of the ideas that we touched on last week. And today we're going to build on these ideas. We're going to build on the ideas. You know, I'm gonna ask you because my chat box keeps popping up and popping up. Let's have conversation and questions towards the end of the hour. So if you have a question, maybe try to type it in a little bit like in the second half or the last third of the class. Uh, that would uh, really help uh, So thank you in advance. Okay, so save your questions, write your questions down, but type them in at the end of class, okay. All right. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do, if you have the source sheet in front of you, is you'll see we're going to talk about the concept of canon. And I think that I also touched on this last week, but I want to review it. The concept of canon is a, a very fluid one in the Second Temple period. Uh, what did Jews write their holy texts on? You had in Egypt, you had papyri, right? The, they're essentially sheets of paper that were very durable uh, that lasted for a very long time in dry weather. Uh, and they're from the reeds, right? That are so uh, abundant by the Nile. Uh, but Jews did not write their holy scripture for the most part on papyri. They wrote their holy, holy scriptures on scrolls, right? 
Now we think of the Bible as a closed book. I don't have my Tanakh right next to me. It's on a shelf. I'm not going to grab it. But the Tanakh is a Bible from the word Biblos. Now Biblos really means a book, but there were no books in the second temple period in the sense that there were no sheets of paper that were sewn together regularly and circulated when you're talking about scriptural texts. Scrolls were what was used and scrolls are extremely expensive and require a particular skill to produce. And so your average Jew, whether that Jew is living in Jerusalem or north in the Galilee or in Antioch or Rome or wherever, the average pious observant Jew of common Judaism would not have had in their personal library a scroll of every text that they considered authoritative because you would have to have a lot of money to own such a collection and you would have to commission a scribe to produce these scrolls. So in the ancient world, in the second temple period, you might have scrolls of the Torah, of the Pentateuch on your shelves, but you might not have a scroll of Yehoshua, or you might not have a scroll of Daniel, or you might have a scroll of the book of Jubilees, which ends up, of course, not being in the Tanakh, or you might have a scroll of Tobit, because Tobit is a wonderful and entertaining pietistic book, or you might have a scroll of the book of Judith, but not the book of Esther, because only Judith has references to Jewish law and God and prayer, Esther doesn't have those things. And so there is a fluidity when you can add a scroll to your shelf, you can remove a scroll to your shelf, and this fluidity perpetuates into the early rabbinic period. But in the early second century CE, uh, scrolls tend to be replaced because scrolls, again, are expensive, they're unwieldy. Some of them are large, many of them are small. Again, if you go to, if you look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, they're teeny, teeny, tiny. But it's much easier and cheaper to write these things down in a biblos, in a book. And indeed, in the early second century, that's what early Christians and early Jews begin to do. And so when this happens, when the holy writings begin to be written down on books in the second century, see on sheets of paper that are sewn together, you have an increased dissemination and increased accessibility to these holy texts that simply does not exist in the second temple period where these texts are the domain of the highly educated or the highly wealthy. So when you're dealing with a world of scrolls, there is no urgency to determine what is absolutely in and what is absolutely out in the way that you have a sense of urgency when you have a book and you need to decide what am I sewing into this binding and what am I not going to sew into this binding? What's going to be in, what's going to be out into this Biblos? And therefore, the rabbinic conversations about what goes into the Tanakh and what doesn't go into the, into the Tanakh are quite late. And sometimes this surprises my, my audience or, you know, this is like strange. How come the rabbis are still arguing about Shir Hashirim and Kohalat? Well, there is no need to have these urgent discussions in the Second Temple period. However, there's widespread agreement that the Torah, the first five books, are authoritative and scriptural, right? Widespread agreement on the Torah. By the end of the second temple period, you have the Nevi'im, you have the books of the prophets, pretty much set in stone. What is quite open is the collection of the writings, the Ketuvim, and that does not get settled until the early rabbinic period. But what this means, it's actually a boon for writers of the second temple period, because what it means is that there's a kind of open invitation for scriptural interpretation that invites anybody to actively interpret, you might even say rewrite, that's a, scholars talk about rewritten Bible, I don't like that term at all, but there's an, there's an invitation for writers, whatever language they're speaking, to actively engage in the world of the text, to interpret it in a way that is really, that takes a lot of creative license and sometimes some radical thinking. And we're going to see that this, um, Actually, I don't think that it happened in the source sheet, but I'll just mention it, that this creative license actually appears in the Tanakh itself, in Nehemiah Parakhet, when in the years following the Babylonian exile, Ezra and Nehemiah gather the people to Jerusalem and they've just rebuilt the walls around Jerusalem. And this is a very big moment in the history of the restoration of Judea. And Ezra reads the Torah in front of the people and everybody cries and the Levim say, don't cry. You should open it up. It's very interesting. And the people read the Torah in a way that it, it suggests they haven't read it for many, many, many years. And they read the, the commandment to observe the holiday of Sukkot, which is probably their reading by Yikra Chaf Gimel 
Sukkim Mem and Malaf and Bet. And what do they read in this chapter? They read that you have to celebrate the, the festival of booths and you have to take certain fruits that are indigenous to the land, certain plants that are indigenous to the land. And what do the people do? They use these plants to build Sukkot. Now, if you look at Bayekar Chav Gimel, it doesn't say take these plants to build Sukkot, but there's a juxtaposition. Build Sukkot, build these huts, and take these plants. And what do the people do in the years following the Babylonian exile? It's hard to date this chapter. Maybe scholars put it fifth century, but could easily be much, much earlier, but whatever the case is, what do they do? They actively interpret the text. They say there's a strange juxtaposition here where we're told to build Sukkot huts and we're told to take these, these plants, but we're not told what to do with them. Oh, there must be an implication here that we're supposed to take these plants and use them, these palm fronds and whatever, and use them, myrtle branches, to make huts. And that is one of the earliest instances of intra- biblical interpretation, meaning at this very, very early stage, you have Judeans who are reading the scriptural text and taking active license to interpret it. And this liberal creativity is a defining feature of second temple literature. This, this sense of authority that we can read these scriptural texts and revere them, and at the same time actively interpret them uh, is something that I that I, I will argue is in, inherent to the world of Second Temple literature. Okay, so that is what we're going to say about canon. Now, there's one other uh, thing that I want to discuss with you before we turn to the source sheet, and that is, uh, you know, we're moving towards the next four weeks. Hopefully, you'll join us for the next four weeks, and we're going to be getting deep into a lot of these texts. And one of the questions that we'll be asking when we look at these texts is who are they for? Uh, are these outward facing texts or are they inward facing texts? Are they texts that are inviting uh, Greeks and then later Romans to look at Judaism and encounter it in a positive way? Are they, are they texts that argue for the integrity of the Jewish religion? Or are they texts that are geared towards a Jewish audience to teach them how to act properly, to give them teachings and wisdom and law? And so of course the answer is yes, right? These texts do both of those things. They're inward facing and we're going to see they're outward facing. And what we are going to do uh, for much of the next hour, maybe 20, 30 minutes, is we're going to look at some sources that can tell us what Greeks and Romans we're saying about Jews. And it is very, very important to have this information before we look at the books of the Apocrypha, uh, because you're going to see, uh, you're going to see, first of all, some tropes that appear also in the 21st century about Jews. You're also going to better understand what Second Temple Jewish texts are doing. Uh, and there's going to be a contradiction here. The contradiction is we see in the Second Temple period increasing universalism on the part of Jewish writers, by which I mean. Of course, in the Tanakh, God is a universal God with power over all people. But one of the most uh, prominent themes, especially in Greek diasporan texts in the Hellenistic period, it, uh, one of the most important themes is that God cares for all of humankind. God has an interest in all Jews wherever they live. I'm gonna ask also again, so that we don't use the chat, maybe for the next 20 minutes, just because it pops up. Uh, but thank you very much. And you know, I do want to see your comments, but let's just try to uh, wait a few minutes before we start posting. Thank you. Um, and so this idea that God is a universal God is not simply about power. That's an idea that we already have in the beginning of Sefer Shemot. It's, uh, it's about divine concern. First of all, for all Jews, wherever they live, because that's very convenient for diaspora and Jews who might have a little bit of a guilt complex that they're not living in the land of Israel. But it's also an overture towards Greeks and Romans saying, look, we are not outside of your society. We care about what you care about. Our God cares about us and our God cares about you. And this whole trope, I think, is in conversation with what Greek and, uh, and Roman writers are saying about the Jewish people. And so we're going to actually start outside of the world of the Jews and look at some of these texts. Now, thankfully for us, Josephus quotes and quotes and quotes and quotes all, uh, not all, but many of these writings about the Jews 
many of which are quite antagonistic and you might say today anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish would be better for this period. Uh, and, and we're going to see some patterns here regarding what such writers, Greek, uh, Roman, and also Egyptian, are saying about Jews. One of the big accusations against Jews at this time, as Jews are saying, our God is universal, our God cares about everybody, our God, you know, uh, can be even worshipped by everybody. This is in conversation with both a cause of and a response to, sorry, I'm just exiting out the chat, a cause of and a response to the Gentile accusation that Jews are misanthropic. And this is the core of anti-Jewish claims in the late Second Temple period. And when we look at the apocryphal text, we're going to see constant fighting against this accusation. What is misanthropia? I mentioned this a little bit last week, I think. In Greek, it means anti-person. So there's an argument that even though Jews live all over the Greco-Roman world, they are not really part of our society. They're living among us, but they're not of us. Now you're going to see also a trope that we see today in a contemporary anti-Judaism, which is that antagonistic attitudes towards the Jews has a high level and a low level. What do I mean by that? There are two simultaneous accusations about the Jews happening at the same time. The first accusation is that Jews are too successful. They are too powerful. They insinuate themselves into positions of authority only because they want to enslave all of those who are outside of their own immediate community. That's high level. The Jews are too powerful. What's low level? Jews are dirty. Jews are impure. Jews are barbaric. Jews are uh, pariahs of society draining us, right? Well, that actually could be high level or low level, but we have these two levels of discourse about the Jews and sometimes they appear in the same text. And so that we're going to see is combated by second temple Jewish um, documents which insist on the integrity of the Jewish people, uh, both in a, in a way that suggests a Gentile audience and a Jewish audience. So with all of that, we're going to turn to some sources and here I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so I wanted to juxtapose, maybe some of you have already seen this because you accessed it online. But what I wanted to do was I want to juxtapose universalist texts in the what I would call the later strata of biblical composition. So the, the late texts of Tanakh, so the end of Zechariah, I would say Daniel, and I, I'm not going to get into the argument about how to date the end of Yeshayahu, I do date it late, uh, the end of Jibri Hayamim. These are all texts that actively argue for the universalist power of God. And I wanted to juxtapose these texts with Egyptian, Greek, and Roman accusations of the exact opposite, the particularism the misanthropy of the Jewish people. And I don't remember, I think I did say this last week. Uh, there's uh, the Greek word misanthropia comes up over and over and over in Gentile and Greek and Roman writings about the Jews. Another word comes up over and over and that's the Greek word barbaros, which in Greek means foreigner, but it's much more than foreigner. It really means someone who cannot speak Greek. Now, keep in mind, there are Jews who spoke gorgeous Greek, right? There's Father of Alexandria, there's the writer of two Maccabees whose Greek is stunning. Lots and lots and lots of Jews spoke Greek as their mother tongue. Uh, and you know, just like I speak English reasonably well, these people would have spoken uh, Greek very well, but it's a symbolic accusation, right? Just like, actually, I need to parenthetically say this. I read a really great article about QAnon a few days ago where it argued, maybe controversially, that those who are disseminating accusations about Jews with this QAnon conspiracy theory of like, eating babies and doing horrible things. It's not about the fact that they really believe these things. It's that you could do incredible damage disseminating these ideas, right? And you have to sort of distinguish it. Do these people deeply believe that Jews are sitting around eating babies for dinner or do they wanna do horrible damage with these symbolic accusations that Jews are not among us, Jews are doing us harm. And so it is the latter, right? And I think that you see something similar here. Do these people believe that no Jew knows how to speak Greek? Of course, they all know. 
that Jews can speak Greek. But when you call a Jew a barbarian, that is a non-Greek speaker, and by the way, the word comes from bar, 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 baros, because when you don't speak Greek in the ancient world, that's how you sound. You don't sound pretty, you sound unsophisticated. Bar, 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 bar. So barbaros is an onomatopoeia. So what are they really saying when they call Jews barbarians? It doesn't matter if your Greek is good, right? It doesn't matter if Greek is your native tongue, but there's a symbolic accusation. You will never, you will never be Greek is what these accusations really mean. And yet, you know, if you read these texts on your own, cause we're not gonna have so much time, I don't know that we're gonna really do these inside, but if you read a text uh, like Zechariah, uh, the very end of Zechariah, you know, there is, is incredible universalism in these texts. I don't mean that they're touchy feely and it's all kumbaya singing in a field of lilies, peace forever and ever. Actually just the opposite. Zechariah condemns those Egyptian Gentiles who in the end of days do not go worship God on Sukkot in Jerusalem because the argument of the prophet is that all, every family of nations, all people will be expected to worship God the way that Judeans worship God in Zechariah's day. So it's actually not touchy-feely, but there's an expectation that all nations will be expected to recognize the one true God. And if they don't, well, things will happen that won't be very nice to them, okay? Likewise, in, in Yeshayahu, this is not a touchy-feely text. If you've ever read the last verse of Yeshayahu, you know that. And yet there's an incredible universalism to the idea that all people are going to come to Jerusalem, right? It's not like it doesn't dissolve the covenantal relationship between Israel and God. That's there. The temple is there. Jerusalem is there. But all people are expected to recognize and worship and, and uh, achieve unity through that common but differentiated worship of the one true God. And so this I would call universalist, even if Israel retains its distinct and separate character. It's universalist in the sense that there's an expectation upon all people to come together in worship of the one true God. And the implication, of course, is God cares about these other people outside of the Israel community. God wants the loyalty, the fealty, the devotion, the worship of these nations. And yet, when you look at what Egyptians and Greeks and Romans are saying about the Jews, it's almost as if these texts do not exist. So read these on your own. And again, I said, we have Josephus to thank, particularly his first systematic defense of the Jewish religion written at the end of the first century CE, where he cites all these people that he disagrees with. And he says, you know, here's why each of these individuals are wrong, but he has these sources in front of him and he cites these sources. So for example, perhaps the first anti-Semite although again, that's an anachronistic word. And of course there are no Semites, by the way, I never write anti-Semitism with a dash. I never write anti-dash and then capitalize the S, that's not okay, because that suggests that we're Semites, like Jews are all sort of racially Semites, which is sort of nonsensical. It's a modern 19th century notion of how race works. It, it, it's, not, it, it's not really, you know, there's nothing scientific about that. And um, it also, yeah, I write lowercase anti-Semitism without a dash, if you're interested. Okay, so Manot, though, we would call him an anti-Semite <laughs> today. What is uh, what is Manatho? So say he is an Egyptian, uh, he's an Egyptian priest in I think the third century BC. What does he say about the Jews? There are by this time stories about the origins of the Jewish people and their relationship with Egypt. And Jews are telling their own stories about their the defeat of their god over the gods of the ancient Egyptians. And you can imagine that Egyptians might have heard these stories and been very, very turned off by them. And so some of these stories are reversed in the Egyptian tradition uh, to make the Jews look quite, uh, quite bad. And so here's what Josephus says about Manetho. This writer had undertaken to translate the history of Egypt from the sacred books. And he begins by stating that our ancestors, the Jews, came against Egypt, in other words, waged war against the good native Egyptians with many tens of thousands of people and gained mastery over the inhabitants. In other words, there's something in here that's a kernel that relates to Shemot, the familiar story that we know from the book of Exodus, but it's different, right? Because in this version, the Jews gather tens of thousands of people just out of the blue 
And they're not enslaved by Pharaoh, they enslave the Egyptians. And so unprovoked randomly, the Jews are like, you know what, we're living among you, but we don't like you. We're gonna make you our slaves. We're gonna wage war against you. It's a total reversal of the Exodus story. And of course, again, there's no motivation provided because the Jews are just um, misanthropic, right? They're just anti-people. And then Manetho admits later that the Jews were driven out of the country, which contradicts this idea that they gained, right? Total mastery over the inhabitants. No, later Manetho says they were driven out of Egypt. They occupy what's now Judea. They founded Jerusalem and they built the temple. And so for this, for Josephus, this is an inconsistency that points, that, that puts holes in Manetho's account, right? Like here you're saying that they totally enslaved the Egyptians and there you're saying that they were driven out. So pick a lane, Manetho, pick an anti-Semitic lane. Um, and moreover, Manetho took the liberty of interpolating improbable tales and his desire to confuse with us a crowd of Egyptians who for leprosy and other maladies had been condemned, uh, he says, <clears throat> to banishment from the Jews. I just need to take a drink of water and then I'm going to say something about that. Okay, this theme that Jews are leprous, you see this in the early centuries of the common era. You see this in the medieval period very prominently. And you even see it in modern times. Jews are dirty, they're diseased. It is one of the most ancient themes that you'll see in anti-Jewish literature. And again, why am I going through all of this when we're supposed to be talking about the Apocrypha? Because when we get into the world of the Apocrypha, I want you to appreciate how these texts are inward facing and very self-consciously outward facing in a way that rabbinic literature is not. So we're not talking about rabbinic literature in this course, but you are probably, many of you are probably familiar with the Mishnah, with the Talmuds, right? These are inward facing texts. The Apocrypha is not. The Apocrypha is very self-conscious about how Judaism is being presented to outsiders. And it also speaks to a Jewish audience, but these writers are walking tight ropes that later rabbinic writers are not interested in engaging in. Okay, so that's Monotho. And then we have my good friend, Apollonius Molon. And Josephus says, I'm no less amazed at the proceedings of the authors who supplied him with materials. Okay, so he's talking about these uh, people who are influencing figures. Uh, he's not talking about Monotho because now we're in book two. Uh, he's talking about later figures in the first century. And these are people who are writing bad things about the Jews and they're using earlier sources, uh, particularly Posidonius and Apollonius. It's hard to say those fast. Okay, and so what do these figures say? On the one hand, they charge us with not worshiping the same gods as other people. So Jews are bad because they reject our pantheon. But they also tell lies and they invent absurd calumnies, false stories about our temple without showing any consci consciousness of impiety. Yet to high-minded men, nothing is more disgraceful than a lie. I love Josephus. Of any description, but above all, on the subject of a temple of worldwide fame and commanding sanctity. And of course, the Jerusalem temple was, it did have worldwide fame. There are many, many, many temples in the ancient world. But the Jerusalem temple did have a global reputation. And we know that Jews all over the world contributed significant sums of money to the temple. We know this not only from Josephus and Jewish sources, we know this from Roman sources who complain about this, such as Cicero in the middle of the first century BC, who says these Jews are diverting funds from Rome by sending all their money to the Jerusalem temple. We have Cicero's speeches to this effect. And if it sounds to you like he's complaining about dual loyalty, and if it has contemporary resonances, then yes, to all of that, I think it does. Okay. So Josephus says, what does Appian say? Uh, that the Jews are worshiping this temple. It's not this grand, beautiful temple to the unseen God. No, in fact, they're worshiping an ass's head. They're worshiping this, just a random, not very intelligent animal that was not worshiped in the ancient world, as far as we know. And they deem it worthy of the deepest reverence. This is totally disrespectful to the Jews, right? In their inner sanctum of the temple, they're worshiping the head of a donkey. Like this is this is a joke. This is making fun of the Jews' sacred space. But um, Apollonius Molon has a story that he uses to prove this. <clears throat> and this is the story. Okay, so this is really, I think, incredibly significant. Hold on a second. It's incredibly significant because, in my opinion, this is the first blood libel. This text, and everyone says blood libels are from the medieval period. The first one is William of Norwich and the 
whatever it is, the early 12th century or somewhere around there in England. No, Malchus and Kavish says this is the first blood libel. Well, you could disagree with me on that, but this is the story. Apollonia says there's a very famous story that when Antiochus IV Epiphanes, the famous Antiochus, invades the Beit HaMikdash in 175 BC, remember this is the story of the 12 year war between the Hashmonaim and the Syrian Greeks that starts in 175 BC, gets resolved in around 164. And, uh, and, and, and so for around 11, 12 years, the Jews in Judea do not have access to their temple, right? Because Antiochus, Antiochus invades the temple, defiles it. And so what happens when Antiochus defiles the temple? he sees something very interesting that you might not know when you learned about the story of Hanukkah uh, in your youth. He goes in there and Antiochus finds a couch in the temple of the Jews and a man is reclining, a Greek man is reclining. And before this man is a massive banquet of fish of the sea and beasts of the earth and birds of the air. And this poor fellow is gazing at all this food in stupefaction, what's going on here? Antiochus bursts in and this Greek looking fellow is staring at this massive banquet of fancy food. And the king's entry was instantly hailed by him with adoration. Oh, king, thank God you're here. Thank God you've come, oh, I've been saved. And so he falls at the king's knees. He stretches out his right hand and implores him to set us free. Antiochus is totally confused. Like what's going on? You have this big feast. You seem to be doing pretty well for yourself. You got some chub, you're, you seem well fed. What's going on? The king reassured him and said, you know, tell me, oh, that's my typo. Bade him tell who he was, like, who are you? Why are you living here? And what is the meaning of this abundant fare? Like you have this amazing meal and you're flipping out on me. Thereupon with sighs and tears, the man in a pitiful tone tells the tale of his distress. And he says, Appian, this is actually not Apollonius Molon, this is Appian using the source of Apollonius Molon saying, okay, listen, I'm a Greek. And while I was traveling through the province for a, lot of, a livelihood, minding my own business, doing my thing, I was kidnapped by men of a foreign race. And by the way, racializing the Jews, not a modern thing. A foreign race, a different ethnos, ethnos being the Greek word. And I was brought to the temple by force. I was kidnapped by these crazy Jews. I was shut up and seen by nobody. I was basically a prisoner. And what did they do? They fattened me up. I've been fattened on feasts of the most lavish description. And he tells Antiochus at first, you know, these, these attentions are unlooked for and I was deceived and they, I'm sort of changing the third person here, the first person to make it a little more vivid for you. And they caused me pleasure, but then suspicion followed and then consternation. What's going on? Why are they keeping me here? Why can't I leave? Finally, upon consulting the attendants who wait upon me, I heard of the, this is so great. I mean, it's horrible, but it's actually like amazingly entertaining as well. It's sort of like titillatingly entertaining. Like, I heard of the unutterable law of the Jews for the sake of which I was being fed. The practice was repeated annually at fixed season. And now if you know anything about blood libels, you can guess as to what is going to happen next. He finds out that at a fixed season every year, the Jews kidnap a Greek foreigner, fatten him up for a year and convey him to a wood where they murder him. They sacrifice his body with a ritual. They eat his flesh. Maybe QAnon is reading this. They eat his flesh while immolating the Greek and they swear an oath of hostility to the Greeks. The remains of their victims are thrown into the pit. Now, let me ask you a question. If you are a Greek living in the ancient world, what is the worst thing you could say about somebody if you wanted to just absolutely condemn them as being dangerous? That this is a human eating monster who kidnaps innocent people while swearing an oath to the gods, or swearing an oath of hostility to the gods, there's literally nothing I could think of that could possibly be worse than this description of Jews that is being disseminated by this Appion in the first century BCE. And this is the story that's going around about the Jews. Now, can you imagine as a Jew hearing that your sacred temple dedicated to the unseen and omnipotent God, people think that this is a place where you're kidnapping innocent Greeks and slaughtering them well, they slaughtered them in the forest because they don't want to get the, the floor of their temple bloody. But this is, you know, can you imagine hearing this as a Jew? The indignation, right, that you would feel knowing that people are believing this or, like I said, maybe they didn't believe it, but they know how much damage it does when they spread these ideas. Anyway, so the man, Appian continues, stated that he had now a few days left to live because I guess he was fat enough that the people would like enjoy eating him. 
and he implores the king out of respect for the gods of Greece to defeat this Jewish plot upon his lifeblood and deliver him from his miserable predicament. And again, I absolutely read this as the first blood libel, right? The Jews are ritually murdering the Greeks. And of course, it's a calumny. It is obviously false, right? At, at least it's obvious to the Jews, it's obvious to Josephus. Now, again, we're going to be turning to the apocryphal books, uh, actually not next week because of President's Day weekend, but in two weeks, we're going to be looking for the next four classes deeply into these texts. And don't for a second forget that the writers of those texts are very, very sensitive to these stories. Now, again, they have a Jewish audience in mind, right? They want to encourage their Jewish audience to stay true to their ancestral traditions and not just to stay true, but to take pride in them, to have pride in their ancestral traditions. But at the same time, there's an incredible sensitivity and an awareness towards what the outside world is saying about the Jewish people at this early stage. And later, this is for maybe a different course, early Christians will pick up on these tropes and superimpose them onto accusations of deicide, right? What is deicide? The murder of the God, the murder of the God. The Christians don't invent these accusations. They simply lift them because they're already there. Josephus, and by the way, I recommend against Appian to anybody. It was just a phenomenal, a phenomenal, actually quite readable work uh, that I think is incredible, especially for those who say Josephus was a traitor, Josephus wasn't true to the Jews. If you read against Appian, you'll know that's just totally unfair. It's unfair to say that about Josephus. Okay. Apollonius, unlike Appian, has not grouped his accusations together, but he scatters them here and there all over his work, reviling us Jews in one place as atheists, and as misanthropes, and these are Greek words, right? A theist, somebody without a God. What could be worse in the Greek world than to not have a God? Misanthropes, anti people, Greek words. In another, reproaching us as cowards, whereas elsewhere, on the contrary, he accuses of temerity and reckless madness. And so Josephus picks up on this, these two levels of accusations that we see in contemporary discourse, right? The high and the low. Jews are too powerful and Jews are garbage. Jews are low and they are just, you know, diseased. He adds, we are the most witless of all barbarians, another Greek word. Remember, it means foreigner, a non-Greek speaker, and are consequently the only people who have contributed to no useful invention to civilization. And so like, I, again, I would say today, there's something that is distinctive and unique about this kind of hatred. Of course, there are all kinds of biases and all kinds of antagonisms in the ancient world, but there is something specific about the Jewish people that makes them unable to assimilate in the Greek imagination. Even those Jews who do assimilate are still treated as Jews. And I can give some interesting specific examples if, you're, if, you, wanna, um, if you want a few at the end of, of this talk. Okay, we have another example over here. Apollonius, uh, of these facts, Apollonius Mola took no account when he condemned us for refusing admission to the persons with other preconceived ideas about God. Maybe I'm not gonna go into this exactly. If, uh, if however, it is seen that no one deserves better, uh, no one observes them better than ourselves. Okay, fine, all right, you could read that on your own. I wanna get to Cicero because I mentioned this speech already. This is in 59 BCE. Cicero gives a speech to the Senate and you can find it online. It's absolutely fascinating. This is a mistake here because I should have put this in parentheses. What this passage is, do you see that? When I change the document, do you see that? Can somebody nod? Because I can only see a few of you. Okay, I'm, I don't see anybody nodding, but I'm gonna assume that when I add quotation marks, you can see. This paragraph is not uttered by Josephus. It's cited by Josephus, it's uttered by Cicero. So Cicero gives a speech to the Senate and he's trying to pass a bill. And the bill is, to prohibit, to legally prohibit the export, note that word, the export of gold from the Roman Empire to Judea. Now, why is export a very strange word? Because four years earlier in 63 BCE, Judea becomes incorporated into the Roman Empire. So in 63, remember the, the Hashemunai period is from 164 to 63 BC. So Judea is independent for a whole century, exactly hundred years. But in 63, Pompey, P-O-M-P-E-Y, the Roman general, invades Jerusalem. There's a big, big, big disaster that is not commemorated in our holidays. It's not commer commemorated in our scriptures. And so many of us don't know about this massive disaster, but it's a huge disaster. The fall of the Judean Hasmonean monarchy to Rome in 63 BCE. Now, for a while, Judea is the client king 
a client kingdom. So the Herodians rule it and the Hashanaim rule it. And then by, um, by 6 CE, Judea is fully incorporated into the Roman Empire, but for 67 years, no, 70, wow, that's significant. That's a significant number, 63 plus seven. For 70 years, uh, Judea is a client kingdom of Rome, which means it's under the thumb of Rome, but it has a degree of independence. And so four years after Pompey invades Jerusalem, tens of thousands of Jews are killed. Cicero says, you know what? Judea is still sort of outside our empire. And Jews in Rome or in the Roman Empire are treating Judea like it's a separate country when we know it's not. And what are they doing to the separate country? They're sending all their money. And that's not okay because they should be sending their money to support the temple of Jupiter in Rome. And so Cicero, this is an incredible historical detail. He says, I see, I'm gonna wrap up soon. He says, I see all these Jews who've shown up like a Haganah, who've shown up to protest my speech because they know what I'm about to say today, that I'm trying to ban the export of gold to Jerusalem. And I'm gonna speak quietly so that they don't have the satisfaction of hearing this speech, right? You know what a big crowd it is, how those Jews stick together, how influential they are in informal assemblies. So I will speak in a low voice so that only the jurors may hear for those are not wanting who would incite them against me and against every respectable man. The Jews are powerful, right? The Jews, they have lobbyists and they have, you know, PACs or whatever they're called. They have, you know, all these different modes of power and they're here today listening to my speech and I'm not gonna give them the satisfaction of hearing it. When every year it was customary to send gold to Jerusalem on the order of the Jews from Italy and all of our provinces, the, the uh, prefect, uh, Flaccus forbade by an edict of his exportation of Asia. So Flaccus is a prefect who already initiated this process of banning the export of gold. And Cicero loves that. He says, who is there who could not honestly praise this action, right? To resist this barbaric superstition and superstition comes from the Latin superstitio as opposed to the Roman religio, the legitimate religion. It's an act of firmness to defy the crowd of Jews when someone in our assemblies, they were hot with passion for the welfare of the state was an act of the greatest seriousness. Okay, so, you know, look at this. You could access the speech pretty easily online. You could look at the whole thing. I mean, it's unbelievable how Cicero uses the theme of Jewish power to depict Jews as dangerous. And the final, final source, we have an individual named Lysimachus doing the opposite, right? Not high anti-Judaism, low anti-Judaism. The Jews have leprosy and scurvy and other maladies. They take refuge in the temples. They live a mendicant existence. They steal from others because they have nothing of their own. Okay, so you know, now you have a sense and I'm not arguing, I'm not arguing that every Egyptian and every Greek and every Roman hates the Jews in the ancient world, but there are intellectuals who are writing at this time, who are portraying the Jews as dangerous pariahs of society. And when we go into the world of second temple literature, we have to be reminded, especially when we're talking about diasporan, pietistic literature written in Greek, that these texts are sensitive to what Greeks and Romans and some Egyptians are saying about the Jewish people, inward facing and outward facing. And now, we're going to uh, pause and I'm gonna take a look at some of your questions. Uh, again, to answer some of these questions, the source sheets are online. So if you go to the registration page of Torah in Motion, you can find this week's source sheet and last week's. I haven't uploaded the next four. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure though, that by a particular class, you have the source sheet for that class. Um, uh, okay, so there's a lot going on over here with all these questions, and there's a new message. Okay, thank you very much, Esther. Okay, how did the Jewish output of writings compare in volume to other similar groups? You know, uh, that's a fascinating question. I, iPad wrote that. That's a joke. I don't know who iPad is. Uh, it's a fascinating question, and we don't have great literacy rates for the ancient world, but uh, there is a, a scholarly uh, a consensus, I would say, that literacy rates were higher among Jews. You know, what that means is very, very hard to determine, but literacy rates are higher, and uh, in the Roman world, literacy rates were quite low, uh, I would say. So what does that mean in terms of the output of writing com in comparison with other groups? You know, we just don't know, but we know the, the, the Jews are incredibly prolific, especially in the second century BCE. When did Latin become common? Why did Josephus write in Greek and not Latin? Yeah, so uh, 
right. So in the first century, uh, I, 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 it's similar, I think, to Hebrew and Aramaic in the sense that <clears throat> in scholarly circles, intellectuals are still writing in Greek, even though if they're speaking in Latin. But yes, there is Latin being spoken in Rome at this time. But Greek is still a language of, you know, the philosophers, the Stoics, of course, that's earlier. But even, uh, you know, poets are still writing in Greek. Uh, so that's a very interesting question, even as they're speaking Latin. Uh, were people coming to the Beit Midrash for festivals? Okay, so I did actually, um, this is Susan Hornstein's question. I did actually address this last week a little bit. We have archeological evidence of pilgrimage roads from all four directions going to uh, Jerusalem. I think, the, uh, I think the name of the archeologist who's worked on this from Hebrew University is, the last name is Tepper, maybe Yotam Tepper or Yonatan Tepper, but, uh, but there's been some really interesting work on this. And, and what do I mean by a pilgrimage road? That's not wide enough for Roman chariots, but it's a few meters wide, wide enough for families to walk together. And so there's absolutely evidence that Jews were coming to the temple three times a year for the pilgrimage holidays. But again, you're not talking about every single Jew doing this. It's a very, very hard trip. So certainly it was done. Uh, we know from Josephus that the year that Jerusalem was besieged, so 69, on Pesach, he says, the reason why the siege was so horrible and starvation was so great and disease was so catastrophic is because of the overcrowding uh, that uh, on Pesach that year, all these pilgrimage, all these pilgrims came to the city and they got stuck um, in the siege. And so I think that he put uh, it's a, at least a couple hundred thousand. I don't remember his exact numbers, but hundreds of thousands of Jews came on pilgrimage. Again, it still means that the majority of Jews didn't. But yes, you have significant pilgrimage uh, from the diaspora. Of course, those Jews then go home. What we don't have, which I think is Yotan Tepper, what we don't have, interestingly, is we don't have evidence of a mass aliyah in the second temple period. So we don't have any evidence that Jews from Alexandria or Rome or wherever are en masse moving to Judea and settling there permanently. No evidence for that. We have evidence of pilgrimage. They go, they bring their sacrifice, they pay homage, they go home, and they send some money. Uh, okay. Um, didn't Cicero make this speech to justify the taking of that year's donations to Jerusalem temple by the Romans? No, oh, we're talking 59 BCE. To justify the taking of that year's donations to Jerusalem temple by the, I'm not sure what you mean, because I'm not sure if you're confusing CE with BCE, but if I don't understand your question, please tell me. Uh, what about Aramaic? What sectors of the Jewish population spoke Aramaic? So Aramaic is, a, is an umbrella language and Jews who are still in Eastern regions of the empire are speaking Aramaic. The Jews of Judea are likely speaking Aramaic. There are different kinds of Aramaic, right? The Jews in Antioch are speaking Aramaic. Again, it's not the same as Palestinian Aramaic. Uh, it's an umbrella language of the East. Uh, but in Western, you know, East and West is a little bit, uh, you know, hard to sort of perceive because this is not like a linear map over here. But Jews in North Africa are speaking Greek. Jews along the Levant except for, I would say, the land of Israel and modern day Sir Syria and Turkey, they're speaking Greek. Uh, okay, anyway, what I'm gonna do now, because there are so many questions, what I'm going to do now is, um, okay, thank you for that about books. Uh, I'm going to allow you to um, ask a question, unmute yourselves. So if you wanna call out, we have a few minutes left. After I finish speaking, we can invite, uh, you can stay for uh, Mrs. Simi Peters lecture, which begins uh, at 1115 Chicago time, 1215 uh, East Coast time. So if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask now. Uh, I remember reading that the earlier Greek religion had a sacrifice that was very similar to this first blood libel that you talked about, where the Dionysians, the, the Menads, would take the king and kill him every year. They take him out to the forest and kill him. Do you, does I that know that's worse, and I would be very interested in seeing it. Oh, okay. Yeah, feel free to, if you can find the source, feel free to email it to me. I'm not familiar with it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, please do, please do. Any with other the, questions? May I ask? Yeah. Uh, with it, do you hear me? I hear you, but I don't see you. Okay. okay. 
with the scarcity and expense of writing material on what do you base your assertion that the apocryphal material that we have at hand is such a small slice? Well, a lot of the apocryphal texts were widely circulated and incredibly, incredibly popular. We know that because they're circulated in different languages, we don't have the manuscriptal evidence from the second century or first century BC, but we have later manuscriptal evidence from the medieval period. These are widely, widely, widely popular texts. I'm just making a statistical argument, right? I'm saying it's very hard to preserve a text for 2000 years, right? And if you have the Apocrypha, the Pseudepigrapha, the New Testament, Josephus, and Philo, right? You have thousands and thousands and thousands of pages that we have. I'm making a statistical argument. I'm saying there was a lot written that wasn't preserved, right? We only have Josephus and Philo because the church preserved it. We only have the Pseudepigrapha because Johann Fabricius went on a tour of monasteries and libraries in the ancient world, you know, that had from the early medieval period, from the 900s, had saved these texts for whatever reason they found them to be religiously significant, right? New Testament, obviously. So there are particular reasons why these texts are preserved, but they're mostly preserved in the, I know we have Tobit from Qumran, but we, the majority of these texts are preserved by the church, right? Of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls, are, that's a totally different thing because they're discovered very serendipitously uh, in the late 40s and early 50s. But I'm just making a statistical argument. How much more existed that wasn't preserved? Maybe, but maybe what, what was what not, what, maybe what was not preserved was, uh, was because it wasn't relevant or it wasn't particularly significant. That's, you know, absolutely, right? But I imagine that there was a lot of religious literature uh, that somebody thought was significant, but others didn't. Biblical how did the how yeah. did the how did the early Christians feel about all this anti-Semitic Greek literature? They still had a, an affinity to the Jewish people. Well, you know, at a very early stage, they took it personally because they were Jewish Christians. I'm talking about in the second or the third century later on. Oh, and there was no. more, of a, more of a division. Okay, so by the second or third century, you have literature of the church fathers. So you have Justin Martyr in the second century who writes dialogue with Trypho. And if you read dialogue with Trypho, you're gonna see many of the same tropes that you see in uh, texts that Josephus cites that are antagonistic towards the Jews. If you look at other later uh, church father texts, Tertullian in the third century, Origin of Alexandria, these are church fathers who are incredibly antagonistic towards the Jews. But, you know, like I say with the Jewish literature, the church fathers are polemical. They're not representing the average Christian. They're making an argument to these average Christians, separate yourselves from Judaism, right? So in the fourth century, John Chrysostom, the church father from Antioch says to his audience, I know that some of you are going to synagogue on Saturday and you're going to church on Sunday. You can't do that. The church fathers are overcompensating for the fact that there hasn't been a separation between Jews and Christians. And so you see polemical, a polemical overcompensating for that. And so at a very early stage in the second century, uh, early Christian writings are very antagonistic towards Jews, but on the ground, many, 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 many people believe that they are Jews and that Jesus was the Messiah. So the separation doesn't happen <coughs> until much later. Enjoyed your lecture immensely. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. I want to be able to make sure that you all have a 15 minute break. You have uh, this class starts at uh, 10 o'clock my time. I don't make the rules. I just follow Rabbi Kelman. You can get all this information. Uh, it starts yes. 10 o'clock Chicago time, 11 o'clock yeah. East Coast time. So I, I, like I said, I just follow the rules. Uh, you can get other information from the Torah Motion website in 15 minutes. Mrs. Simi Peters is speaking. I see that some of you have your hand raised. Some of you uh, haven't had your questions answered. And I wanna make sure that if you do have a question, it is answered. And so again, I'll put my email over here. We're not meeting next week. We're meeting in two weeks. And I'm very, very excited to get into the text and talk about the novellas of the second temple period. Why did you say that the Dead Sea Scrolls was a tragedy for the Jews? <laughs> okay, I'll say it again, but anyone, you know, feel free to turn your camera off or take a break uh, because it's gotten so much face time that many assume it's representative of normative second temple Jewish life where it's so sectarian and it's so not representative. And not only is representative, some of you because I hear an echo, but it's also an extreme form of a sector. They were probably Essenes, but not even regular Essenes. They were probably 
extreme it seems. So everybody knows about the Dead Sea sect, but they don't know about things that, you know, every Jew read. Uh, so in that sense, we have to read them with a grain of salt. There were maybe 100 to 150 people living at this site that had a particular worldview. They were very uh, against the administration of the Jerusalem temple. Uh, they, they, you know, this is not representative of what we would call common Judaism. And so I think that many use this as a text to prove or as a collection to prove that Judaism indeed was sectarian and fractured and on the decline in a way that I think is a very negative portrayal of Judaism. And I Malka, to... if yeah, this is yeah. Simi, I just need you to, um, to, we have to figure out the host thing. Okay. Yeah. So I'm making you a host and I am not a host. Great, so. great. It worked. Thank you so much, Malka. Thank you so much. I caught the last few minutes. It was fantastic. I appreciate that. And I'm sorry that I can't stay on to hear yours. Okay, no problem. Uh, but I will sign off and I hope that all of you have a wonderful two weeks. All right, thanks everybody.